Hi, so I'm John. I'm, uh, so this is my, my first uh, closure con, pretty much first closure anything and first chance to meet a, a bunch of closures. So it's really exciting uh, to be here. And thanks to Cognitech for, for having me. So uh, yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, robotics. So just as a summary, I was just gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we do at uh, BrainCorp. And then I'll talk a little bit about this application that I've been working on for uh, monitoring and fleet analysis of our uh, robotic fleet uh, at BrainCorp. Uh, then I'll just talk a little bit about my experiences sort of as a beginner, uh, sort of journeying through uh, the closure ecosystem. And then if I have time, maybe talk a bit about some what could be some interesting application areas for closure within robotics. Um, yeah, so first of all, overall, we're trying to just basically uh, at BrainCorp, just making it less painfully difficult to, to make a robot from scratch. So uh, as it stands right now, it's just, it's just really hard. There's just so many things that you have to worry about. Uh, so uh, we're trying to do a platform and really be an on-ramp for companies and ultimately individuals who want to uh, build autonomous machines. Um, so we envision a world where uh, people are made more productive and happy and fulfilled uh, via robotics. Um, so we definitely work with a lot of third-party OEMs. We, try, we, don't, we really don't want to be building our own robot hardware because that's just too hard for us. Uh, so uh, we work with companies that they've been building these machines for, you know, in some cases, 60, 70 years, and they really, really know how to build these machines uh, super efficiently. So uh, like you add $5 to the bomb cost and they'll freak out like you just wrecked our profit margins and things like that. So. Uh, it's definitely an interesting relationship. Um, and uh, so like I was saying, it's still really, really hard to build, deploy, scale, and just do everything involved in deploying a robotic fleet. It's probably just too much for one company to take on at scale. So there needs to be more standardization, there needs to be more uh, tooling around it, and w ultimately our goal is to provide a lot of that. Um, so. We are work right now mostly with just big uh, companies that do lots of different machinery, but uh, ultimately like, we'd like for developers and all kinds of people to be able to participate in, uh, in, in robotics. Um, so we have reference designs, we have base autonomy solutions for uh, development and a development SDK, manufacturing tools, and then cloud infrastructure and fleet management tools, which I'll be talking about uh, to some extent. Um, yeah, so I work on the scrubbers, I thought I would show. Um, so it works something like this, I don't know if you can see here. Uh, it's very simple, sort of the simplest product we could possibly do, which is just a floor scrubber. Um, and it's very simple, you just get on it, you go to a home marker, these little Aruco codes, uh, you scan it, and then you just teach it a route, and you just drive it around the store. So we operate mostly in different commercial environments, places like Walmart, places like you know, uh, Target airports, all kinds of places like that. And this can be quite large. I think they can be up to like 800 pounds if they're full of water. And, um, so you just teach it, you come back, and then you save it, and then the result is a route. And it looks something like this. Uh, so it's a single, it's a one-shot learning kind of uh, system. So you teach one route, you get a route, a route like this. And just for scale, you can see in the top corner, that's t uh, 25 meters in that bar there. So this is easily football field sized uh, route here of a, of a store. Um, so yeah, mapping is, is one of our core, one of our core competencies, competencies I would say at BrainCorp. Uh, for a long time we actually had 100% what we call map convergence where uh, map convergence essentially means the map comes out well. Um, so yeah, so let's talk, start a little bit of what I've been working on. Uh, so, Yes, it's in the robotic space, but in many ways, it's just another, just an, another application is probably similar to what pe people have done. Um, so basically, our machines, they produce a lot of data as they're in the field. So there's kind of roughly two sources. One of them is from events, where, which is sort of sparse data, sparse information about what the robot is doing. And then the other is like telemetry, which is dense information, which is robot data. Um, and so this is basically aggregating a lot of event data and then 
fetching a lot of telemetry data on demand. Um, and just full disclosure, this is not uh, currently like a core product at BrainCorp. This is mostly something I'm working on. Uh, as, a, as a side thing, it's not a deliverable at this point. So, but who knows in the future what it will become. Um, yeah. Uh, so just a quick overview uh, on the back end. So it's kind of typical application closure. Uh, then I'm using Ring, uh, PostgreSQL, Postgres. Uh, and then I'm currently using Docker for deploying uh, just internally right now, which has actually been quite well. So I can just, it's just a Docker pull basically, and we use it internally, internally for just analyzing and understanding assist and limitations uh, of the robot. And it's nice because anybody in the company can just do it and it works across platforms and it's not really that, that challenging to maintain. Uh, so I'm using Postgres essentially as, just to, as a database derived from an event stream. Uh, it's operating, as, and then it's also operating as a cache of this telemetry that I was talking about uh, as you fetch it. Um, and then using Neanderthal, which has been really cool, uh, and Core Matrix, um, and I'll talk a little more about this. Uh, so a number of different libraries for, for dealing with matrix data, um, both on the front end and on the back end pre-processing. Um, and then I've really enjoyed using JDBC Next, or no, just JDBC currently, and um, uh, uh, the Honey SQL, which I don't know, which is like a, uh, DSL for producing SQL data. Um, and then I'm using spec for validation and event destructuring, which I'll talk about a bit more. Um, and then on the front end, just using, yeah, typical things. Uh, also 3JS currently for the telemetry replay stuff. And then GLSL and WebGL, obviously all the, all the um, drawing is, uh, of laser scan data is happening inside of the vertex shaders. And uh, yeah, then I'm also kind of experimenting, this is sort of more experimental, but I'm using a data script database as the core app state for the front end. Um, so that's been, I kind of want to just get as much power as possible into the hands of the developers and us. So I've found that just being able to query really readily lot, large amounts of data um, has, been, has been pretty cool. Um, yeah, so right now it's kind of just a portal to uh, this, this database, the Postgres database. And um, so all of the, you just basically write queries right now. And um, all of the, uh, all of the resources are, are pretty much are stamped with positional information as well as with time information. And then it, it just automatically will generate all of the, uh, the plots by, by just matching it, matching the result set. Um, so this ends up being quite useful for development purposes as we build it out more, building out more, uh, you know, more user-friendly features. But uh, for internal use, uh, it ends up being quite simple. Um, so just an example of a view of a plot uh, that we can be generated. Uh, so this is a plot of assists at a particularly challenging environment. Each of those dots represents, on the right side there, uh, represents an assist. And you see there's different colors for different assist types. Um, so we can see this is an environment full of tight spaces. Um, and this is a particularly, so this is pulled over the course of the months operating at this particular route. Um, and then on the left, you can just see this is a visualization of a subset of those assists um, via, the, the, via the replay. So it's really easy to just pull up a bunch of assists and view the replay of, of the uh, robot for those assists. Um, we also indexing and querying all kinds of other things, replanning all uh, events. Um, yeah. So, and then yeah. So we operate with lots of lots of different environments. And one thing we find is that the distribution of assist is totally different for different environments. Uh, so th this is like a query for the top 30 routes with the most um, assists, and then. Um, we can see that in some cases it'll be things like, like tight turns, like in that previous cases, or really crowded environments. Other times it's like highly dynamic lighting and things like that. Other times it's, uh, there's just lots of motion. People are just too much commotion for the robot. So we really don't want to understand those cases. And then other times, other times the environment's just too sparse. Like there's just not enough stuff around. Localization uh, will struggle and things like that. And so part of the goal is just to help us understand all of these different types of environments. Uh, where we struggle. Uh, so yeah, so uh, it's kind of the kind of things that are useful that may be of interest uh, to you guys, for us anyway, 
is uh, like we want to be able to know, like do all kinds of queries, like where are the tight turns, and do queries for all the the narrowest aisles, and do things like what, show me all the skipped, all the skipped aisles, all the global replannings, all the you know U-turn maneuvers, the most dynamic environments, the brightest environments, and so what we're really trying to do is just do a lot more uh, indexing of our data, and then also deriving more and more uh, semantics from the telemetry data so that we can query for these high-level features, things like the brightness of the environment, the, um, the, the, uh, the size of the aisles, and things like that. Um, so click on the replayer. So this is not that good yet. I'm still working on this. This is built on uh, 3JS currently, but it's kind of been focused on throughput for the most part right now. So I'm reading all of the messages I'm being read uh, inside of web worker processes, and it gets more or less directly transferred to the vertex shaders uh, and rendered. So I'm able to handle like a good dozen replays at once, and you can just just be able to get a good high-level view for a particular kind of environment. Like, how's the robot? How's the robot doing? Uh, one thing it doesn't do super well at this point is like super precise, in-depth, uh, where you really want to analyze exactly what the, what would happen in a particular context. So I'll talk a bit more um, about that. Uh, but it's part of the way, so it's built on top of ROS, mostly it consumes ROS messages. I don't, how many people here have heard of ROS, roughly speaking? Okay. Uh, so ROS is like a well-known, it's becoming somewhat of an industry standard. It's short for robotic operating system. Um, and I'll, I have another slide to talk about it. But so ROS message is one of the key things that it, it defines, which is a really kind of important thing. It defines a, basically a message format for how, how to communicate robot data between processes, between boxes, whatever. And it also defines a large set of uh, standard ROS messages for all kinds of standard things. Like, for example, I'm showing here uh, the, lasers, the standard laser scan message. And this ends up being really nice because it, uh, it makes it really relatively easy to integrate with uh, third parties because they just, they just write a driver, let's say, for the LiDAR, and it just provides laser scans. And you already know how to read uh, laser scans. Another cool thing is also self-describing. Uh, which is to say that any, I can have, you know, any reader can read uh, ROS data generically, and it doesn't need to have any scheme, schemas communicated uh, out of band. But, um, so that's cool. So it actually serializes this type information pretty much online, like as it comes in, which is a, it's a little, bit, little bit unique. So you can read it either generically as raw data, or you can read it uh, typed as well, if you, uh, if you read all the, the connection headers. Uh, so yeah, so I thought I'd mention real quick, I did develop a ROS bag reader for Clojure uh, for CLJS. Um, so it's totally open source, so anyone can check it out, but it's, it's very alpha at this point. In fact, it's not, even, it's not even in Maven yet. I haven't figured that out. Um, so I thought I'd just mention, so it's really simple. You just pretty much read, open the ROS bag, and then you can just read it as raw Clojure data, any ROS bag. Uh, and for anyone that's interested, it's, it's definitely like a great place to start. There's tons of free... ROS data out there, like Udacity has many hours of autonomous uh, self-driving car data that's just available as ROS data. So that's definitely a cool place to just kind of uh, start messing around with different algorithms and things. Uh, the other thing developed as part of the um, replayer was losing the slide. Oh no, yeah. Um, so called just TF. I don't know if anybody's heard of the TF transform library in ROS, um, but it's quite a useful thing. It's sort of just a way of keeping track of multiple coordinate frames over time. Like it's basically a big um, scene graph over time, or like sort of, um, or a transform tree essentially over time, sort of like you'd see in any kind of scene graph or something like that. Um, but you can query for it over time. So you just you add uh, any uh, transforms to it, and you associate a frame with those transforms, and you associate a time with those transforms. And then you can look up uh, a transform from any frame to another frame at any time and do so efficiently. And this ends up being like pretty fun and cool to implement in Clojure because it's so simple. You can just basically store the tree in a immutable, uh, the transform tree in an immutable map, and then just dump the history into a um, skip list, and then you can just query it by time really efficiently. Um, so yeah, that's also available, and I'll try to make sure that's in Maven at some point. Um, 
Yeah, so a bit more about ROS at a high level. Um, so, and this is where we get into some of the, some of the issues that we've ran into. Um, so it is kind of a very, very much an actor model, kind of very Erlang style uh, actor model. Uh, so there's kind of a lot going on here, but it definitely like in each of these um, bubbles, like this is its own process. It's, uh, it really has nothing in common necessarily with any of the other processes. So for example, the um, localization runs under what we call a ROS node. The uh, local cost map, uh, which is what the robot will use to navigate in a local context, would run in a node. And these nodes don't necessarily have anything in common. They could be in different hardware. They could be in the same process. Um, and all they, all they share are these ROS messages that get communicated uh, between them. But uh, so as you can imagine, the big, the big thing that you run into pretty quickly with a ROS system is just non-deterministic, and it's very difficult to reason about uh, what's going on here as you build all of these nodes, and they're all asynchronous agents communicating asynchronously. Uh, it gets very challenging to, um, to, be able to really reason about what's going on. Um, So yeah, so limitations of ROS. Uh, so we find we've over time we've kind of found it to be like a very bad for building a deterministic navigation system, which is very kind of core thing uh, that we have that we worry about is the deterministic nature of our whole system. So we really want to be able to say like you know given a set of observations and given given a perception, it can form a solid basis for perception, and then which in turn forms the solid basis for planning and so on and the command. So you can associate uh, directly from the sensor data, the, the ultimately the plan that gets uh, computed and then also the, the command. Uh, so yeah, uh, so this is a big issue with ROS based replayers in general. They get really good for getting kind of a, an idea of what's going on. They're not so good for getting an exact, here's exactly what happened on the robot which you often need to do if you're trying to diagnose a particular uh, problem that's, uh, that you're seeing, where you want to be able to, to say exactly why did it choose what it chose, and you need to have a solid uh, basis for that. Um, so that in, the, in the newer version of the replayer that I'm working on is, is based more on a snapshot model. So you really want to snapshot um, the robot data like at the gate, like before you, um, do uh, perception and before you do planning, uh, just so that you have that solid basis and you can associate directly from your uh, your odometry and your and your laser scans to the command. Yeah, so we're moving in this direction. I don't know if anybody's heard of Captain Proto as a message format. So we've we've run into problems with ROS. First of all, it's not great for storing large large amounts of data. Um, and there's a number of other things with to do with versioning, compatibility. So uh, Captain Proto is actually kind of an interesting message format. So this is an example of like a snapshot. This is not actual, not what it actually looks like. But here you see a clear snapshot of like a brain scan, is what I'm calling it, which includes the percepts, it includes uh, the plan, the command, uh, the, t the monotonic time. Oh, that's another issue with ROS, by the way, is all the synchronization happens based upon the real-time clock or the NTP clock. Uh, and you obviously are subject to all of the issues there with potential um, uh, shifting and uh, corrections. Um, so this is based on monotonic time, and uh, yeah, it's based on snapshots. Um, so kind of cool things about the the Captain Proto protocol. Uh, for one, there's no decoder or encoder step. So this data lives in memory exactly as it lives on the wire, exactly as it lives. Uh, on disk, which is like really important because you're shoveling huge amounts of data around uh, on a robot system. So you really want that to be as efficient as possible. And uh, Captain Proto definitely delivers uh, there. The other thing is that it's uh, highly evolvable. So new fields, enumerants, methods, and things uh, can be added to structs and they don't break backwards compatibility. And you can even change the symbolic names of fields without breaking uh, compatibility. Uh, and then there's an RPC layer with it as well, which well, we don't use that so much yet, but it's, it's also interesting. Um, so the newer replayer probably will be based more on Captain Pro, our Captain Proto based 
Um, then, yeah, so I thought I'd transition a little bit into sort of my journey. So I've been doing mostly C++ and, program, and Python uh, programming. So we, we pr use C++ for anything that's performance sensitive, and then typically we'll PyBind to it. Uh, uh, PyBind is a way of basically binding Python to uh, C++ libraries, so you can get good performance from the C++, and then, um, yeah, and then Python on top of that. And part of the thing there is like, one of the things that's kind of unique about robotics is that you really have to rethink the development cycle because you need to be, have research basically directly involved in the product. And they typically like to use uh, Python, they like to use high level languages, they like to have this whole environment. Um, and they, you really need to have it be closely integrated with the core product teams because uh, you, know, you have to get data from the field and you have to improve the product after shipping it. You can't just say, oh, we're gonna do all this research and then we're gonna make a product out of it. Um, so we find, we actually embrace high level, high level languages to some extent. Um, that said, so I've kind of interested in Clojure. You do run into issues with Python and I, so I'm kind of interested in Clojure as a, as a dynamic language uh, with a lot of the advantages of Python and then without, uh, that, and, well, advantages over Python that make it uh, suitable for like heavier workloads. Uh, I would say like Clojure is relatively more amenable to optimization. Um, so yeah, limitations of Python. <laughs> this was uh, some kind of it's a funny slide, but uh, I don't know if people have heard of the gill, uh, but in Python, there's something you, you will run into uh, is the, what we call the global interpreter lock, which means that any, any thread in Python can only be, only one thread can be executing at a time. Um, so it's a major limitation, and there's a lot of effort within the community to get around it, basically release the gill, do a lot of work with, in your uh, C++, totally independent of Python. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting because, you know, clearly there's a huge amount of demand for this, for Python. It's growing enormously, uh, with, even within robotics, um, despite it having a number of, of issues. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, yeah, so closure libraries, um, closure versus Python. Obviously, uh, yeah, Python is vast, like order of magnitude larger uh, endeavors in these libraries. Um, but I th I'm really excited about what's going on with Uncomplicate, with a lot of the libraries there. Uh, by the way, these are totally made up logos. They don't, none of them have logos as far as I know. Uh, so a barrier there apparently is a dragonfly. And then I'm just gonna say that uh, an ostrich is a duel, of a, or a flu kitten is the duel of an ostrich. <laughs> uh, this is a category theory. Um, yeah, so, uh, this is the, I've, it's some really cool libraries. I would definitely recommend checking them out. So I've been using Neanderthal for and, um, a lot of matrix stuff. Uh, and it's, it's, it's super cool that you can just do, I think he has a talk about it, but you can just do you know, low level uh, optim programming and optimization in, in Python in a REPL. Um, so I think it's pretty exciting what's happening on the library front for Python, uh, or sorry, for Clojure uh, for, this kind of, for this kind of stuff. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about interactivity. Uh, so overall, I really liked the CIDR closure uh, experience for REPL-driven development, although uh, I would point to a few things. First of all, I have having all kinds of slowing down over time, but I don't know what's going on there. But um, I do miss some features from Python that I thought I would point to, but maybe they can be addressed. Um, for, for one, uh, the way the you know the syntax for local binding in Python is unified with like module level assignment, so you can treat any binding as if they were defs essentially, and I can just send data inside of a function or assignments inside a function to my REPL and just evaluate it there. Whereas I can't do that with Python. Like you, I often find myself wanting to explode a let into a series of defs so that I can get a better so I can have them in my environment. But in Python, you can just do that automatically. Uh, so I just I thought that. Would, uh, and maybe maybe there's something we can do here. Maybe Rebel can help here. The, I haven't been able to get that to work, by the way. But um, that is one one thing I find that I miss from the from the Python side. Uh, so tools. That's the I was using Line for a while, and switching the tools definitely the CLI tools definitely was a huge 
huge win for me. I, had, I, never, I always felt kind of afraid of line configuration. I didn't really, I never could understand the mapping of, of the config to what was going on, especially with like trying to get fig wheel working and things like that. So I, I definitely really liked uh, the CLI tools. Oh my God, I'm at 37 minutes. Okay, I gotta move quicker. Um, so web workers. Yeah, so this is just real quick. One thing I had a lot of trouble with was getting, getting a sane web worker build uh, working. So I've, um, yeah, trying to do code splitting. It doesn't seem to be a way to split, make code split and make one thing be a, be a, a web worker. So that's a challenge. Although it's possible in CLJS, so, which is I'm not using currently, perhaps I should be using. Um, but it seems like it's kind of a fork. So I'm, so it's, this is a little confusing for me. Um, it seems like maybe this project is a huge project uh, and it seems pretty proven, but maybe it should be more part of core. Uh, so core matrix in Neanderthal, this is another pain point. Um, I know I've been following, there's been some debate as to whether like Neanderthal should be a back end to core matrix or what not. And I'm kind of sympathetic to both sides on that, but uh, I do think like we need to target a, a, a good high level API competitor for like NumPy, Matlib, that kind of API. Um, and there are some letdowns for someone coming from Python or any, anything like that to a core matrix. It's first of all, not as well maintained. Second of all, uh, there's just a lot of ed rough edges and things like that. Um, and again, uh, it would be great if um, Neanderthal could work as a backend for a uh, core matrix. A uh, little bit about event streams. So this was kind of core to the backend. So I was using spec. This was part of the original impetus, actually. I was using spec to uh, destructure event streams. Maybe this is a weird use case. But uh, so we had like a lot, we have a lot of events coming up from robots of different data. And um, for example, like I'll do, define an autonomy session at the bottom here as like an auto st start event followed by a series of auto events followed by an auto stop event, for example, like that. And just, you can just apply it to a series of events and just destructure it into your thing. Only issue I ran into there, which ended up being kind of a big problem, was like there's no equivalent of RE find all with uh, spec, like you have to match the entire collection. Uh, it's a little bit technical, but it's, it's a, it ended up making it quite difficult uh, to do this kind of a stream processing thing. Um, I thought another point to, uh, last also to Geome, uh, which ended up, which is just crazy. Has anybody heard of Karsten, uh, Karsten Schmidt? This guy produced a gigantic amount of libraries and work, and it, it, closure didn't really seem to notice him too much, uh, the community, but uh, yeah, huge amount of cool stuff so that, I've been, that I've been using. And I'm gonna be using uh, Geom for kind of the version two of the, of the replayer. So I definitely would recommend checking out his stuff. I thought I, I'm not gonna go through these, but a huge number of libraries for doing all kinds of things for uh, 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 geometry and, and things like that in Clojure, in Clojure script. Um, I was also, I'm working on specking it. I'm specking Geom and documenting it a little bit better, which is this huge geometry toolkit. Uh, one thing I'm running into is I, I don't know of a way to spec protocol impl implementations, and it's mostly defined in terms of protocols. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, and then finally, uh, yeah, waiting through the CLGS front end. So I spent probably too much time here, but I really, um, really wanted to be able to experiment with doing data script driven reactive materialized views, but there isn't really a solid offering here yet. So I looked into Precept, it's kind of doing this kind of thing with uh, the Clara rules, which is kind of interesting. Fact UI, which I'm showing here, was really interesting in this, in this regard, uh, where you basically can just write these uh, data log looking queries and it'll automatically update as soon as that any dependency on that changes. So this was like really cool. Uh, but it's missing a bunch of features, it's not really maintained. So this could be, I think, a really interesting area. Uh, so I guess I don't really have time to go through this. I was going to go through some other applic uh, other areas uh, that I think closure could be interesting, but um, maybe I'll just uh, go through real quick. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the planning side, which te well, from our experience, planning tends to become like super complex and hard to reason about, and it tends to be heterogeneous. 
Um, so we use a variety of different planners, and these are all kind of standard styles, planners DWA for a short term. So these planners, all these different planners operate at different time scales and at different, in different contexts. Um, and part of the thing there is just spreading out the risk. Like if we're gonna roll out a new planner, we'll try to apply it in limited, in limited settings and limited contexts and understand its weaknesses. Uh, so we use different planners and we have to do a lot of work to manage them, and that tends to be very complex. Uh, so I thought it could be an interesting area for research is like rules-based planning manager, uh, which could be kind of cool to express uh, action as rules on top of perception. But the cool thing there is all this explanation of why a rule is chosen, which we always are, always are having to struggle to, to deal with. is just like, why did the robot do what it did? Why did it slow down? Why did it turn? Why did it uh, do all this? And you get this kind of thing for free. And it'd be especially cool if you could send that up and uh, have it available to query and index. Uh, even as a replacement for events. Um, and then on the perception side, I think it's particularly interesting for Clojure, especially doing perception in the cloud. Uh, so I think it could be an interesting exercise to just take any common robot data structure and imagine what it would look like at scale, which could be interesting for people uh, in more in the cloud space. Because uh, for example, doing pose graphs at scale, I don't know if you could model a pose graph as in, in Datomic or what that would look like necessarily. Uh, PoseGraph is like a fundamental data structure for doing, impl implementing mapping, where you're basically trying to align a whole bunch of different scans uh, in the optimal fashion and to do it quickly. Um, but doing that at scale uh, could be interesting. The other thing is the global cost maps area. Uh, so this, for example, is, is doing exploration. Um, this is a different, this is for the, this, the vacuum project. but. Um, you can see it building a, building a global cost map just as it navigates around. But I think this could be an interesting area uh, for other research. Uh, to just model each update, to basically just update the novelty, which is I think is something uh, like Rich has talked about to some extent, where um, you basically have a stiff the state with what's in the cloud and then just send the delta and uh, then just reflect the perception across the fleet. Uh, so that's an interesting area. Uh, yeah, then papers and textbooks are always great to implement. Uh, I think this could be really cool. And then, yeah, call it. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>